Okay, everybody who's here to hear Tucker, Tucker we're going to start the program. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Michael Knight. I'm the senior curator of Chinese art here at the Asian, and I'm most famous for a statement I made about working only with dead artists. So it's rather nice to be here with a live artist. Tucker, I think, presents, for me, a very fascinating uh, kind of combination of things that come together in, in his artwork. Uh, he grew up in New York. He actually did advanced training, advanced uh, studies in Chinese art history at Yale with Dick Barnhart. He has lived in Taiwan. He worked at the Asia Society as a preparator, so as installation designer, but also in an assistant curatorial capacity. So he has that kind of art historical knowledge of Chinese art, Chinese painting in particular. Also, he's handled these objects as abstractions, as objects that have to be dealt with. Don't break it. How do you install it? How do you deal with it? And then he also makes his own art uh, based on this kind of experience. So Tucker, why don't you talk about that just a little bit? Uh, yeah, and we were talking before, it feels a little bit like there have been lots of pieces along the way that have almost led to this particular project in that so many of the things that I was doing uh, years ago uh, were really about a lot of these objects and then I went away for a long time painting my own things and now I have a chance to come back and think about, reflect on what it was like to be uh, especially that part of handling these ceramics. So. The, the museum that I worked at in New York, the Asia Society, has a much smaller but uh, in some ways very similar collection in terms of ceramics. There are things on view here that are remarkably similar to the things that I spent a lot of time with in the storage facilities and putting into crates and working with mount makers and stuff. So this kind of gave me a chance as I was walking around thinking about what, what was that? What, was, what does it feel like to handle these things? There are so few people who get to do that and here I was this you know, 20 some year old person who had no training in how to handle things. I just happened to be careful. I don't, I don't break things very much. So anyhow, I just started to, it gave me a chance to start to think like what, what, what is it about a museum that I want to represent or want to think about? And I started to make, I've been making drawings like this for many, many years now. And I started to incorporate some of the pieces that are actually in the collection here into, into what I've been drawing over the past few months. And the idea was really to make a kind of storage shelf that uh, was decidedly not seismic, seismically uh, designed and put as many of them on the shelf as I could fit because that's really something you can't do uh, with, with real objects. So it's, it was really just a chance for me to think through the experience of handling objects like this and then what does it mean to now put them in the, in the context of a museum like this where there are rules that apply and, and with two dimensional things on paper I don't have to abide by those rules. I can stick tacks through them and things can sit on top of each other. And so it's kind of a chance to finally break all the rules that I had to be so careful uh, to abide by when I was in the storage rooms. So actually a number of the pieces, as Tucker's saying, that are on, up here are pieces that are on view. Talk about the process, how that, how that came about. Well, there have always been things when I've come to the museum that have caught my eye that I've really been a fan of. And a couple of those are here. And, and we're going to walk in just a few minutes. And we'll walk by one of them. But one is right here, um, which I can't even say anything about what it actually is. But I will say just a, what I like so much about it is it is a relatively contemporary ceramic piece that's based on a bronze, an, a very ancient bronze shape. And it has this very postmodern element to it. It's this crazy bright blue color, and it just seems like something that a contemporary artist would would do now. So that's always been something that I, I knew I wanted to draw that. Um, and then other pieces are things I, I literally went around with an iPhone and just took a lot of pictures of things that caught my eye, and then made a lot of drawings back in my studio. So that the scale of things, even though some of them I knew the scale because I I've looked at the collection a lot. The scale of things on the iPhone all gets exactly the same. So all of the scale of the things that are in the collection here is completely off. Some things that are very small here are actually quite big, like this piece. And um, this is actually about, we're going to walk over there. You'll see that's about the exact size that that one is. Um, I feel like there's some that have flipped the other way, too, that I can't <laughs> see right now. But, Anyhow, it's, it's really all been mixed in with things that don't exist at all, that have, you know, this is not a bowl that is here. And this clearly is not something that can really even function or exist as a bottle. 
I wanted to see what happens when I put all of them together. What does it feel like to take real objects? I don't usually paint or depict real things. So this was a, an exception that just made so much sense to me that now I was curious what happens when it gets mixed in with all the things that I'm already making, these much more vague and less plausible shapes and less plausible things. I mean, you can't have plants in the museum like this. So it's kind of fun just to even be making plant-like forms. You can't have things that float. So that's kind of fun for me. They can't have water bottles. So just these things started to all merge together and I wanted to see what happens when they go, what does it feel like for me, that's what I'm most curious about, but then what does it feel like for, for visitors to see such a wide mix of things? Earlier we were discussing about the experience of coming to a museum like this and, and the, the, the conflict between not knowing what it is, seeing the beautiful object and, and not knowing what it is and what that experience is, is like. Did I say that right? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I think for most people who don't read every label, uh, coming to a museum like the Asian Art Museum, you have, it's almost just like a river of beautiful objects that are all spot lit and these incredible shapes and colors. And you come away almost as if you've been, it's, it's similar to being like in a jewelry store or something. You just see these beautiful things. And so I'm, I want to know what, what's the difference between that and, you know, these are real things that came from real places that had a real value long ago, and now they're here. And how do we experience them as someone who just lives in San Francisco or just wanders through the halls? I was very much on a path of studying all of this and really knowing the knowledge and knowing where this was from and who made it and what the inscription was. And now, I, now my Chinese is bad. I, you'll see it's all X's now. I, I couldn't even really, I couldn't even push myself to rewrite Chinese because it's sort of a lost, language to me now but yeah that there is that difference between that pursuit of like knowledge and scholar scholarship and just the experience of being around beautiful things and I don't know I don't really know where I where that is for me right now because I started out on one path and now I'm now I'm, I've kind of left that path behind in some way so this was a chance to revisit that study and that interest and that all of these objects really I love the, the beautiful object kind of thing because we were looking at this particular drawing right here, which it's one of a pair of large-scale jadeite uh, vases, objects that were made probably around 1900. And to me, they're about as ugly as they get. So that one we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more as we, as we move on, but let's go ahead. I just wanted to say on that note that it is really, to me it's really exciting. You, you have this sense that a curator loves equally all of the things in the collection, but of course, What's really true is that curators love certain things very deeply. And you hear about some of those things, but you rarely get to hear something like that, where it's like, There's, that thing is just plain ugly. <laughs> and so I appreciate that. But, but it is true that there are certain things that I know, you know, and maybe we'll pass a couple that are things that you have a particular relationship with, that you have a particular fondness for. And we hadn't talked before I did this, so none of these are seated with anything that Michael and I have talked about. But since uh, since I did this, we've talked a little bit about some of the objects. So maybe we can go see a couple of them now. Okay, let's do that. So we're looking at, the, this is the piece that he has the drawing on, that he's a kind of postmodern piece. And in a very real sense, it is that, except it was done somewhere between 1736 and 1795. So it says so right there. It actually gives us the 50th year of the reign of the Qianlong Emperor. So that is 1736 plus 50, 1786. So it's actually given an exact date. And then it says who commissioned it and under, under what circumstance. So it's a, somebody from Mongolia who's making this for probably a Tibetan style Buddhist temple somewhere in the northern part of China. So it's all of that. And the turquoise blue, of course, it's copying an ancient bronze shape, something that would have been done a couple thousand years before this piece was created, more than that. Um, but they were never that color of blue. So it's fascinating to see this. This is a, a kind of a translation of an ancient bronze shape into something in the 18th century. Now we've got something in the 21st century, another translation of that, and, and Tucker's work down the way. Well, so that, what, what Michael just did is something particularly that you see in Chinese painting that is just endlessly fascinating. It becomes this series of kind of, it's almost like a little bit of a rabbit hole where every painting that's been collected and widely shown 
has so much evidence of the history of that actual piece of painting. So you have the person who made it and their various uh, chops and inscriptions and colophons, and then the people who have collected it since then, or maybe a, po a famous poet who it was once shown to. And so all of that gets built in, and the, the painters know that. So they're painting in a style that shows that they know a history of, of China, and they're also thinking about the people in the future who are going to look back and see this and unpack that history. So I wasn't really making this thinking that it would become a part of that history, but it, it is the nature of these things that as you start to make art, when you're thinking about specific art, you can't help but push along that history. So this is going back so far from a very functional object well, actually, I guess the, the bronze one of this wouldn't have been very functional. Would have been in a, in, a original, in a ritual context. Yeah. But it starts to lose its functionality quite quickly, and now it's become a you know, two-dimensional drawing with tacks stuck through it. So it, those progressions are, are pretty amazing. Should we go over and look at that wall? Well, one thing about this wall that I... I've always loved this wall uh, coming to the museum, and it's, it really uh, brings to light an element of something that I, um, I think about in my own work, which is display. And there's something about really all forms of Chinese painting or Chinese art that display is uh, so deeply rooted in the art itself. So a lot of, uh, a lot of the formats of painting are, have display built in, whether they're hanging scrolls or folding screens or album uh, leaves that you would flip through. And of course, this is very much uh, display. Now this display itself is the museum's work inspired by a very real display that you can learn about over here. But what I liked about this and why I was thinking about this so much is that this wall is literally the size of the cutout of the wall that that, that gallery is. So this kind of fits as a puzzle into the the drawings that I've done on the other side of the wall as sort of a completed uh, space, which is not something that I really had thought about very much, but it really, once I saw this and I saw the space, it became clear that I was going to make a sort of two-dimensional version of this, which was decidedly more chaotic and less composed in a lot of ways, but this was really what started me thinking about what I was going to do here. I, I was asking you, Michael, maybe you can say a little bit about how how you chose what goes in here. As we were walking out just a little while ago, Tucker said the trophy wall, which is about what the, which is just about exactly what this is. Um, the Chinese term is treasure wall, and what this is is, is a there's a wall in the the Forbidden City in Beijing, uh, which holds objects that were collected by the Qianlong Emperor, the same emperor whose uh, title is on or reign is on the piece over there. He was a great collector. He wanted to own everything, and in fact, not only did he own everything, but he, he wrote all over them, put his seals all over them, messed them up, and then, and then owned everything and just covered his walls with them. Those are, these were his trophies, his treasures. So he had these walls specifically designed to hold particular objects. We were looking at the, the image uh, in this publication on the Forbidden City and said, you know, Brundage was a lot like the Qianlong Emperor. Brundage, who was, whose collections are the foundations of what we own here, we're gonna do his trophy wall as well, his treasure wall. So we did that. We actually went through the treasure wall there and tried to find as much as possible similar objects. They're not all by, they're not from a particular period, they're not from a particular media. It's just a mix of kind of wonderful things that are like what the, the Qianlong Emperor would have, would have owned. There are pieces here that in and of themselves are great works of art and deserve all the kinds of things that they would, should get from being out by themselves and kind of featured but that also kind of makes a statement about China and, and collecting in China and about Brundage and about museums. So it was a nice kind of combination. Yeah, all of those things are exactly what I like so much about, well, this project, but just coming to a museum like this is that all of those different levels of information and interest, they all got compacted. And, and for most people, they just come and see this and they say, oh, that's a lot of beautiful things all at once. But even just, even just, there's a part of your mind when you see this, it's so activated by so many different things, it's a little bit hard to focus on any one of them. And that's something that's, that I'm really interested in the work that I'm making now is when you take specific drawings that 
could stand on their own in my mind, and you start to make them all together like in a bulletin board, something happens when you collect them all. So I've now looked at this wall for a long time, and if I walked away from it, it would be hard for me to, to describe any one thing that's on this wall because I'm much more experiencing the whole experience of it, which I think is very much what he was after, this kind of like, look what I have. Look at all that yeah. I have, look what I own. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting kind of process, and, and a process that you must have gone through in, as you did your wall as well, the process of choice and making the decisions about what to install and what not to say. In this case, we talk about the wall as the wall, as a treasure wall. You know, a piece like this, uh, again, late, late, middle 18th century, uh, there's endless things to be said about that. The patronage, the imperial patronage, the meanings of the hundred flowers, what that motif means, the kinds of technologies that went into creating the overglazed enamels. You know, there's a dissertation in that piece. But here we chose just to put it up here as part of a wall about a, a context or an attempt at a context mixed in with cloisonne and jades and everything else from, from that period. So would, with, with him, would he have, would there have been themes running through it or was the kind of idea is to even break any kind of themes and just say, I have all of this. Look at I all have, my stuff. I have all of this. So he did, and he did volumes of publications on his collections. Yeah. So, you know, and he lists all the things that he owned. And his, the big focus, of course, were the fine arts, painting and calligraphy, but he also, jades, and he wrote poems on jade pieces, as well as, as contemporary. He wrote poems right on paintings and clicker right over them, right. stamped his seals right in the middle. He was into possession and into showing that he owned these kinds of things. So. Yeah, he's a, great, he's a great figure for a museum to have to grapple with. Yes. Right? <laughs> Fascinating figure.